Good afternoon, uh, everybody, uh, and welcome to today's uh, seminar in the SSLT series. Uh, so we're very pleased to welcome today Grant Lamond, who is a legal philosopher from the University of Oxford. And Grant's work has many strands uh, and threads, but one of those strands or threads uh, is work, a series of very careful papers uh, in the philosophical foundations of the common law. Uh, and Grant's kindly allowed us to revisit uh, an older paper within that strand of his work tomorrow. Uh, but for today, I guess we get uh, one of the latest uh, papers in his series of work in philosophical foundations of the common law. And that's what is customary law in Foro. Uh, so over to you, Grant. Thanks very much, Mark. And thanks very much for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here in Singapore today and to be able to present this paper here. So the paper's about what is customary law in Foro. Um, it's a mysterious title in some ways. It's something that very few people who haven't studied Bentham would know about, um, partly because it's a type of law that doesn't get very much discussion. Uh, another way to describe it is sometimes judicial customary law. All right? It was Bentham who first um, coined the term in his comment on the commentaries. And he said there was a distinction between what he called custom in pays custom of a group within the community, and custom in foro, which is the custom of the courts themselves. Still, it would be a reasonable thought to wonder, does customary law matter very much? Okay, customary law doesn't seem very important in modern municipal law. It's very important in public international law, but it seems more of a footnote to contemporary municipal law. But in fact, Customary law is more important than this, and one of the things I want to try and explain today is why it's more important, potentially, than customary law in pays, customary law in the general community, which is truly, in contemporary law, a relatively minor aspect of law. So judicial customary law, customary law in foro, is law that arises directly from the practices of the courts themselves. It's law that is used by the courts but lacks a source, such as statute or precedent. An obvious illustration of such law in England is the royal prerogative, prerogative rights and powers of the Crown that have been long established as parts of the laws of England, such as the power to enter treaties and issue passports, but rests on neither statute nor precedent. But arguably, customary law in foro is even more important than that. It's a well-known fact that the source of the legal force of legislation can't be legislation. And the legal force of precedent can't rest on precedent itself. They can't bootstrap themselves in that way. So what is the basis of the legal status of this doctrine? One very influential view is that put forward by HLA Hart, who argued that the basis for the sources of law in every municipal legal system is a judicial custom, a custom Hart described as the rule of recognition. The ju rule, the ju this judicial custom provides the foundations for the law and is part of the law. Now, other following theorists, most notably Joseph Raz, but also John Gardner, have argued that the rule of recognition is not just a judicial custom, but that it amounts to customary law. And they've said that there can be customary law apart from the rule of recognition. So that's one of the major interests in trying to understand customary law in Foro, to see what sense it can make of Hart's very influential idea about the rule of recognition. But there are other possible applications of customary law in foro. As many people know, there's a long-standing debate within British constitutionalism about the status of the sovereignty of parliament. Some constitutionalists, common law constitutionalists, say that this is a common law doctrine. It was made by the courts, and it can be developed by the courts and modified by the courts. Others argue that it's simply a fundamental part of the rule of recognition, and the rule of recognition being merely a judicial custom cannot be altered by the law. It can only be altered if officials change their practice. But if instead the sovereignty of parliament is a custom, part of customary law, both of these views might be mistaken. Another sort of peculiarity but curiosity is the status of revolutionary constitutions. What happens when a state creates a new constitution which is not validated by existing law? It's normally thought in legal systems which do this 
that the new constitution is the ultimate law in the state. But from a Hartian perspective, behind the constitution, it seems there must be a rule of recognition, a judicial custom identifying the constitution as law. If that's the case, it seems that the constitution is not ultimate, but rather derivative. The ultimate law in a legal system is the rule of recognition. Now, what I want to try and achieve in this paper that I've written is three things. First of all, I want to try and make some progress in understanding the nature of customary law in Poro, building on the insights of earlier theorists, such as Bentham, Hart, and Gardner. The second is to explore the relationship between customary law in Foro and other sources of law, and to explore the question whether customary law in Foro can be subject to legal alteration. And the third is to examine what light the account throws on Hart's rule of recognition. Can it help us to understand it any better? In today's talk, I'm going to skip the initial discussion in my paper of Bentham, Hart, and Gardner. It's well-worn material, um, and it forms a useful background. But the most important things that I have to say will be repeated as I go along. What I want to focus on today, instead, is to outline a view of customary law in Faro and, how it, and explain how it differs from mere judicial custom. I then want to go on and consider three possible implications of this theory. For the rule of recognition itself, the question of how customary law can be altered, and finally, how to understand the status of revolutionary written constitutions. So skipping over Bentham, Hart, and Gardner, skipping over them only in the sense of not going through their thoughts, but my own account is indebted to theirs in many ways. Let me go straight to section two of the written paper, customary law in Foro. On page 11, I attempt to give a summary of the characterization of customary law in Foro. I say, a standard S constitutes customary law in Foro if and only if, one, it is consistently used in the practice of the courts. Secondly, it's used in the practice of the courts as an authoritatively binding standard. And thirdly, its use as an authoritatively binding standard is not due to its being validated by another legal standard. So these three elements, I claim, are the key to understanding customary law in Faro and explain how it exists in the practice of the courts but isn't validated by any other law. So let me say something about each of those elements, starting with the idea that the standard should be consistently used in the practice of the courts. What is it for a standard to be used in the practice of the courts? Well, the key use is its use in adjudication. The standard is used as a consideration in determining the rights and duties of parties before the court or in determining the legal status of various actions and events that have occurred or may occur. This is ultimately the key practice of the courts. There are other practices of the courts to do with their adjudicative functions, things like making orders or being in session, that might also be governed by, by customary law. But I'm not going to be so concerned with those. I'm mainly concerned with those sorts of standards that are actually used in adjudication. And those other standards that might be relevant are relevant in a derivative way, because they too could be used in adjudication. Now, the fact that the standard is used consistently in the practice of the courts is significant in three different ways. The first is simply that it's in the nature of customary norms that they must be practiced in order to exist as rules of some population. To say that S is a customary standard of some group involves the group generally following and using S in the ways that Hart noted in his analysis of social rules, the analysis of social rules that lies behind his account of the rule of recognition. Social rules differ in this way from validated rules. A validated rule, one identified by a criterion of validity, such as statutes or precedents, may also be a social rule. Okay, it may be practiced. Many legal rules, of course, are practiced. But its status as a legal rule normally doesn't depend on it being practiced. It's still a legal rule, even if most people ignore it. It's only if 
the legal system requires practice for something to be continuing in in to continue its validity. For example, a doctrine like dissuadeitude, that actual practice is necessary for validity. Normally, validity is a separate question to practice. So a statute becomes a statute simply because it's passed by parliament in the appropriate way. It becomes valid law. It doesn't require the general population to start following it. Indeed, many people might ignore it. So it doesn't count as a social rule in the sense of a rule that's generally followed within the community, but rather it can still be a legal rule. Now to say that a customary law is used consistently in the practice of the courts, as I've said, is simply to say that there's a pattern of use that's generally been followed in the past. It doesn't mean that the standard is being used very frequently by the courts, but simply that the courts, in their adjudicative practices when it turns up, assume it or rely upon it in some way or other. All right? So that's the key thing. When I say it's used consistently in the practice of the courts, I don't necessarily mean that it's being used very, very frequently, but rather that there is a consistent practice. Now, there are two other important things about the use of a standard in the practice of the courts. For one thing, obviously, the use in the practice of the courts helps to determine the content of the standard. What exactly is it that the standard requires? Okay. So if we're trying to determine which possible standard is actually being followed by the courts, we obviously look at what the courts have done in past cases. Okay. If we want to identify the content of the standard we're going to have to see what the courts have taken themselves to be doing and what they have done. So what the courts have done and what they've said they're doing are both relevant to trying to determine the content of the customary law. The main thing is not, it is important to say, that there's necessarily a standard formulation of the standard. It's not important that the courts have a particular way of formulating the standard for it to exist, but rather that they share an understanding of the standard. That is, that if they were to express the content of the standard, even if they express slightly different contents by doing that, they would mutually recognize those formulations as roughly expressing the same standard. All right. So that's the important thing, that the courts are following a standard in common and that they understand the standard that they're following as roughly the same. Now, it's not enough, even if you do have a standard formulation of a standard, for it necessarily to be one and the same standard. It is possible for people to say we're all following one standard, one verbal formulation. Take the case of when people say we're interpreting statutes on the basis of the intention of parliament or the intention of the legislature. That sounds like we're all following the same standard. But if we have very different understandings of what that means, we may not be. Someone might mean by that, I'm trying to work out what the legislature would have wanted us to do in this case, this unusual case. Or we might be asking the question, what would a reasonable legislature have intended us to do in this case? Or we might simply be saying, we're going to interpret the law according to the accepted canons of interpretation because we assume that they were the canons that the parliament or legislature had in mind when they passed the law. Now, if these are in practice very different, we can have different standards being used even though we've got a common formulation. So a common formulation is not key. It's often useful, and it's the simplest case. Again, the simplest case is one where we have a standard that we're following. We can articulate it in a certain way and our understandings of that way are sufficiently the same. But it's not necessary. That is, though, the, the, as it often is the standard case. And finally, the other thing, of course, that it's important to understand, looking at what courts have done in the past, is ordered, in order to give content to the standard. Often to understand a standard, you need to understand how it's actually been applied in the past, how it's actually been used. Okay, that's just a general fact about any general term, that to actually grasp its content often involves understanding how it's actually used in practice, not just by giving it a verbal formulation. So that's all I want to say about the standard being used consistently in the practice of the courts. The key thing is that it's used in their adjudicative practices. 
It's a consideration that is taken into account when they're determining the rights and duties of parties or when they're determining the legal status of some state of affairs. The second consideration is that this standard is treated as an authoritatively binding standard. What does this mean and why is it important? Well, it's crucial to its status as a legal standard that it be treated as authoritatively binding. Okay? Legal standards are those standards that the courts regard as authoritatively binding. And I mean by authoritatively binding that the courts are under a requirement to use them and are a under a requirement to use them regardless of their views about the merits of the standard. So even if they think the standard is misguided or mistaken in some way, it's nonetheless binding on them. They have to use it. Now, not all standards that courts regard as binding are authoritative. Sometimes courts may, in, they may endorse, for example, a moral obligation. They may all agree morally that the court should act in a certain way. To take an example, all the judges, or most judges, might agree that ju courts and judges shouldn't do anything in their practice that might be regarded or understood as politically partisan. Okay? And it may be reflected in their practice. They may criticize people who do this, and they may generally who don't do this, and they may generally follow it. But whether such a requirement about being non-politically partisan is part of the law depends upon why the courts use it. Do they use it simply because they think it's a good consideration, a meritorious consideration, but, or, would they, or would they still rely on it even if they no longer thought it was meritorious? Do they think it's binding on them irrespective of the merits? To say it's binding on them irrespective of the merits is of course not to say that they can't think it's a meritorious consideration. They can think both. No, there's no conflict between those two points of view. But what's crucial is that they do regard it as authoritative, okay, binding in that particular way. So it's a characteristic feature of legal standards, whether based on statute or case law, that they're authoritative for the courts. The courts are bound to use them, irrespective of the court's view of the merits of the standards. And this is true also of the ultimate criteria of validity in a legal system. Okay, the ultimate criteria being the final basis for different sources of law. Okay, for example, courts are bound to follow the doctrine of precedent in common law systems irrespective of their views about the desirability of such a rigid doctrine and to give effect to legislation, whether whatever their views might be about the abilities of the legislature and the nature of the legislative process. Similarly, other forms of customary law in furrow are authoritatively binding. This is why, if they are in any doubt, courts examine their own collective practices, most noticeably their past decisions, to ascertain whether or not a standard has, has this particular character. The courts will look to see whether there is a settled practice of proceeding in a certain way, on a certain basis, and consider what earlier courts have said about that practice. It may be that they've done a certain thing in the past just because they think that's a good thing to do. They think that's an appropriate way to act, and they've generally agreed that this is an appropriate way to proceed in a certain situation. The question is, do they regard that way of proceeding as authoritatively binding on them? Do they think they should still follow it even if they have doubts about its merits, even if they think it isn't the best way of dealing with some matter? All right? Now, in practice, it can be sometimes quite difficult if you look at past practice to determine which of these it is. Okay, there are clearly going to be some cases where in practice it's hard to know, are they following some practice simply because they think it's a good practice, a desirable practice, or do they also think that it's authoritative for them? Do they also think that even if they no longer thought it was meritorious, they would still be bound to do the same? In some cases, it will simply be inconclusive. So my claim is not that it's always easy to tell these two apart, but rather that there are some cases where it is possible to do so. So that's the idea about the authoritativeness of the um, standard. All right. So we've dealt with the use and the practice of the courts, and we've dealt with it being an authoritatively binding standard. The final important consideration is that the standard isn't validated by another legal standard. All right. So this is simply the standard idea that customary law isn't derived from statute, it isn't derived from precedent. Okay? It's not based on those two sources of law, 
or some other source of law in a particular system. All right? Now, this, of course, can be, there's a sort of aspect of common law practice that can be misleading here, because of course it's the case that when the courts are trying to determine whether there's customary law in foro, they will look to previous decisions of the courts. They will look to earlier cases. But what are they doing when they look to earlier cases? Well, they're looking for earlier cases in the sense that they're looking for authorities, but authorities in the sense of evidence demonstrating that the standard exists and has been followed in the practice of the courts. They're looking for authorities in that sense. They're not looking for decisions authoritatively creating the standard. Okay? The idea that it's case law, that it's been created by a precedent. The precedent is the authority that actually creates this doctrinal standard. All right? So it's often the case that cases are simply acknowledging that there is existing law by which they are bound. In the case of customary law, such authorities are the best evidence of its content and existence, and so will tend to be cited in discussions of such doctrines. But there can be other sources of customary law. For example, if you go back historically, you will often look at institutional writers of high authority, people like Littleton or Hale or Blackstone, okay, particularly for periods prior to the systematic reporting of cases. But the court's own view of what they are doing is clearly the most compelling evidence for the status of various standards. It's also, of course, partly constitutive of the standard because the use of the standard in the case contributes to the standard's existence. Now, in many situations, there will simply be no doubt about the authoritativeness of a practice. And so barristers will not challenge it, nor judges dwell on it. No one bothers to suggest that courts are not bound by the precedence of superior courts, unless, of course, they're arguing something like the earlier decision was given per incuriam, nor do they argue that courts are not bound by legislation. Again, unless there's something exceptional about the legislative process that led to its enactment. For example, in the British Railway Board in Pickin, you remember the case where it said that a private act of parliament had been obtained by misrepresentation and therefore should be set aside by the courts. The House of Lords was not willing to do so. And more recently, in the Jackson litigation, where it was a question of, could the Parliament Act of 1911 be used to enact the Parliament Act of 1949? Okay, could that act that reduced the powers of the House of Lords be used to further reduce it or not? But ordinarily, these questions are just not up for debate. Okay? So when a legal doctrine is well established, there's no perceived need to clarify its legal basis. For this reason, the existence of doctrines that amount to customary law and foro often go under the radar. Their existence is simply too obvious to require examination. But there's also a second reason why customary law and foro often goes unnoticed in the common law tradition. Various customary doctrines are said to be parts of the common law, but the common law is sometimes used to express the idea, first of all, of the non-statutory law administered by the courts. And secondly, it's sometimes used to express the idea of the law grounded on precedent. Customary law in foro obviously belongs to the former category, but it doesn't belong to the latter. As these two senses of common law are not often distinguished, it's easy to slip into the view that all the common law is based on precedent. Okay. This map, mis -map, misapprehension is reinforced by the fact that many legal doctrines are in fact an amalgam of customary and validated law. Statutes and cases can limit customary law, for example, by putting the royal prerogative on a statutory footing, as it has been a number of times in England, or subjecting its exercise to judicial review. Cases can also extend customary legal doctrines to novel circumstances, in which case there is now binding precedent for the application of the doctrine in those circumstances. So another instance of customary law in foro is claims about the inherent jurisdiction of superior courts of record. So there are many, many dicta where courts have said that the inherent jurisdiction of the court is simply inherent in the nature of a court, a superior court of record. And the cases where it's been acknowledged do not create the doctrine, they do not establish the doctrine, they simply recognize that it exists. But of course there are some cases where the inherent jurisdiction is extended to novel circumstances, novel remedies are given. And then of course you can cite that case as authority for that particular application of the inherent jurisdiction of the courts. 
So customary law in Foro is authoritatively binding on the courts, but this is not, as element three notes, due to its being validated by another legal standard. It's directly binding. That's just to say that it does not owe its status as an authoritative standard to its satisfying the criteria in another legal standard, like the doctrine of precedent. Okay. As Hart noted following Kelson, the law is often composed of chains of validity with one standard owing its status to law to it being identified by another standard. But the chains must inevitably come to an end somewhere. somewhere. For Hart, they ended at the ultimate criteria of validity, which he thought of as part of the rule of recognition. So there is no standard validating the ultimate criteria of validity, and equally, there's no standard validating other types of customary law in foro. Customary law is law not because it's validated by another legal standard, but because it exists in the practice of the courts. So that's a very, very um, quick analysis of the substance of customary law. For what makes a standard part of the customary law of the courts? Those three elements that I've identified. What I want to do um, briefly now is discuss possible implications of this view, okay, let's take for, you know, um, if that view is right, what implications does it have for the rule of recognition, for the ability to um, alter customary law by law, and for the status of revolutionary written constitutions. So let me start by saying something about the rule of recognition. Now if it's true that customary law in Faro is not due to its being validated by any other legal standard, then it requires a significant reappraisal of Hart's rule of recognition. Hart's view was this. Hart's view was that the law was composed of two things, the rule of recognition and all of the law that was validated ultimately by the rule of recognition. All right? Every valid law was validated by another law, and there were chains of validity that all went back to the various criteria in the rule of recognition. So in Hart's model of a legal system, there is one judicial custom, the rule of recognition, and then there's the rest of the law. Hart, okay, so... For Hart, the rule of recognition is a social practice of officials. In accepting it, officials accept that they're under a duty to apply valid law, that is to apply the standards identified by the rule of recognition or identified by standards that are themselves identified by the rule of recognition, hence the idea of chains of validity. Okay, so on Hart's view, the explanation for why officials apply the law is that they accept the rule of recognition. Now, customary law in Faro disrupts Hart's view that the rule of recognition provides the solution to two issues. The solution to the unity of a legal system, the idea that all laws trace their origin back ultimately to the rule of recognition, but also to the normativity of the legal system. Okay. So Hart's explanation, he comes up most clearly in his later work in Essays and Bentham, is that the rule of recognition puts the officials under a duty to apply valid law. That's the reason for them to apply valid law, because of the rule of recognition. But customary law in Foro doesn't belong and lead back to the rule of recognition. So the unity of a legal system can't depend just on the rule of recognition, and nor can the normativity of a legal system depend just on the rule of recognition. So if there is customary law in foro apart from the rule of recognition, this presents a problem for this theory. Now there are a variety of ways in which one could try to respond um, to this challenge, if you like. I mean, one possibility clearly is just to say that the model is a very powerful and attractive model, and we should just reinterpret doctrines like the royal prerogative or anything else that looks like customary law in foro and say it's not really customary law, it's not really based just on the practice of the courts, but rather it's a form of case law. It's like precedent. That's how we should reinterpret it. There's some unusual type of criteria that the courts use to identify it and that's it. So we can preserve the rule of recognition as the sole customary part of the law and try and fit everything else under the rule of recognition. Now, um, you won't be surprised to hear that I think that's not the way to best deal with the problem. I think there is customary law in foro, and I think 
that um, Hart was wrong. He was wrong in, in, in an understandable but significant way. Hart was arguing um, against Austin and Kelson in the concept of law. He was arguing against the idea that law was based on the sovereign and also against the idea that law was based on the basic norm. But structurally, those two theories, for all their differences, were very, very similar. Okay? The theories explained membership in the legal system by virtue of everything going back to a single point, whether it was the sovereign or the basic norm, or in Hart's case, the rule of recognition. It explained unity of the legal system because what made a legal system was that it had this end point in common. And it explained normativity. Okay, in the case of Austin and the idea that the sovereign's commands involved some risk of a sanction. In the case of Kelson, because the basic norm made um, laws objectively valid norms, i.e. binding on those to whom they applied. Or for Hart, the rule of recognition put the officials under a duty to apply all valid norms. So the attraction of the rule of recognition, it's a great attraction, is that this one component answers all of these fundamental and foundational questions about a legal system. But an alternative view is simply to say that this is too good to be true, right? That we've got one answer to all these problems. It may simply mean we need different answers to these different problems. Like if we want to understand what unifies a legal system, for example, we need to understand the relationship between the institutions that are involved within a legal system, rather than thinking it's unified by the rule of recognition. It's a common debate, for example, among people commenting on Hart as to why he says there's a single rule of recognition rather than just many rules of recognition. Why say one rather than two or more? Right? Even if there are rules resolving conflicts between them, okay? And even the rules resolving conflicts between the different sources are hard to exactly place within the theory. So why not just give up on that and say, there are different questions here that have to be attract, attacked in different ways. Um, on, the, on the question of normativity, there are really two issues that Hart and other, well Hart particularly addressed. I mean, one question he was not so interested in is what sort of reason laws gave people to conform to the law. Okay, Hart's own view is somewhat obscure. The view that he, the issue that he gave most attention to was the question of what attitudes and beliefs are necessary on the part of the participants in a legal system for it to exist as a social practice. And you'll recall that Hart said it wasn't necessary for non-officials to have any particular attitudes or beliefs about the law so long as they conformed to it sufficiently. By contrast, the officials had to accept the rule of recognition. This was crucial to the existence of a legal system. Except that Hart had a very technical idea of what acceptance means. I won't go into the details, but Hart's account of acceptance is not the ordinary idea of acceptance. It's not what we'd ordinarily think if you say, I accept something. It's a very, very particular account of a certain set of attitudes and certain dispositions to conform to a certain standard. Now, my own view is that it's, it would be better to think of um, the law not as being based, as Hart thought, on the acceptance of the rule of recognition. It's the acceptance of the rule of recognition that then gives the force to the rest of the law, but rather that it's based on the acceptance of the legal system as a whole. What officials and others accept is they accept a legal system. And the question that they are presented with then is, what is part of the legal system? What are the standards that I meant to apply, I meant to give effect to? Now, of course, accepting a legal system doesn't, isn't an all or nothing matter. To accept a legal system doesn't mean, in accepting it, that I will do it come what may. Okay, it means that I have a reason for conforming to the law. But also, there can be other reasons, of course, for not conforming to the law. Okay, so I would suggest that a better way of understanding the structure of a legal system is in terms of officials accepting the system as a whole. And then where does that leave the rule of recognition? Well, it leaves it to play this role. The rule of recognition is a duty imposing rule that tells officials to use certain criteria to identify sources of law. Okay, it directs officials as to where to find the law, but not all law, only where to find validated law, like precedent and legislation. It doesn't tell you where to look to find customary law. 
Okay, that's a different matter altogether. So there's still a role for the rule of recognition, it's just not as dramatic a role as Hart's theory allows. So that's one of the implications of this account, to suggest that um, the, the rule of recognition needs to be given a slightly more modest role, crucial but modest, in understanding the nature of a legal system. Um, a second topic that's related in some ways to this is a um, question that's sometimes arisen as to can customary law in furrow be altered? Can it be altered by the exercise of a legal power? Now, clearly customary law in furrow can change. It can change if the officials change their practices. Okay, if the standard that they're following, they come to understand their standard in a different way, if they come to do things differently, there can be a sort of organic transitional change in their practices that changes the standard. That's fairly uncontroversial. The question is, can customary law in foro be changed by the exercise of a legal power? Can there be a legal power to alter it? Now, the, the answer to that, I think, is that, of course, you can't alter customary law in foro by the exercise of a legal power in this sense. Customary law in foro exists only in the practice of the courts. Okay, it exists, its existence depends on practice. The exercise of a legal power gives you validated law. Okay, but what you can do is you can change the law by, for example, overriding customary law in foro and replacing it with some form of validated law. Okay? They're both laws, and there's no reason why one can't give way to the other. Of course, it's a question of an in individual legal system as to which will have um, preference, okay? which is superior to the other. You could have a legal system, for example, which said you can't change customary law in foro because it always prevails over conflicting rules. Okay? So it's often said, for example, in England, that the doctrine of parliamentary sovereignty, at least the narrow doctrine that the parliament cannot bind its successors, is something that can't be modified by statute. Okay, it's just a fund fundamental part of the customary law of parliament. And therefore, any attempt to change that would fail. But in other cases, if one accepts that things like the royal prerogative are customary law in furrow, they have been altered by statute they have been modified by decisions of the courts. So there's a possibility that there's no reason to think the customary law in foro must prevail over other sources of law. Now the most interesting question here is whether it would be possible to modify the ultimate criteria of validity itself. Okay, these are the things that for Hart are crucial to the rule of recognition. The rule of recognition provides us with the ultimate sources of law. Can they be modified? Now again, I think this is a contingent question on, for different legal systems, but I see no reason to think in principle it can't be possible. It seems to me, for example, quite possible for, for example, or at least quite theoretically possible for the UK Parliament to abolish the monarchy, for example. Okay? In which case the criteria for the validity of legislation in Britain would change. It would no longer be um, acts passed by the Queen in Parliament, but rather just acts passed by Parliament. Now, of course, it would be a, a puzzle of this that it, for such a, a, a change to occur lawfully, it would have to receive the royal assent. So um, the monarch would have to, as it were, um, uh, play a hand in doing away with the monarchy's role in legislation. But I don't think there's any reason to think that that's not legally conceivable. Once we look at the temporal dimension of law, there's no reason to think that validated law, law made by legal powers, can't encroach on and perhaps even just replace um, customary law, even if it replaces the ultimate criteria of validity. So for example, in Britain, even if you put, for example, the whole of parliamentary practice in the written constitution, let's say you said, we're gonna pass the Constitution Act. The Constitution Act from 2020 will determine the appropriate basis on which legislation will be passed and all rights and duties of parliament. Again, there may be difficulties in, in drafting this, but it's not clear that it couldn't be done. 
It's not clear that you couldn't put the uh, source of law in Britain, which is currently, in a sense, customary, on a fully statutory basis. The one objection that sometimes is pressed to this sort of question is this. It's sometimes said that the problem with this analysis is that you could change the criteria of validity. You could change, for example, you could pass an act saying that in future legislation must be passed in some way or other. But the courts might simply refuse to act on it. And what matters in the end is what the courts do. It doesn't matter what the law says. Okay, that in the end, the ultimate criteria of validity are dictated by what the courts do. Now, in a sense, that's true. Okay, there's no doubt, in a sense, that if you know, what the ultimate criteria of validity are or what the um, criteria actually used by the courts. But nonetheless, the important thing here is generally the courts use the ultimate criteria of validity because they regard them as legally binding. Okay, they regard the doctrine of precedent, they regard the sovereignty of parliament as legally binding doctrines. Okay, doctrines that they must follow as law. Now, if they were willing to allow that those doctrines could be modified by statute, there's no reason to think that the law can't be changed. It's, of course, always a possibility that the courts might refuse to follow this change in the law, but it's always a possibility that the courts could refuse to accept other changes in the law as well. And the courts could say some piece of legislation, some ordinary piece of legislation, was not valid, even though it seems to all intents and purposes valid by the accepted criteria at the moment. Courts could just reject it and have some strange rationale for why it didn't actually satisfy the criteria of validity. And so it could just say, we're not going to follow this act, even though on any ordinary understanding it does. So the fact that the courts could resist or reject a modification of the ultimate criteria of validity isn't, I think, doesn't show that you can't change the ultimate criteria of validity by the use of a legal power. It just shows that the courts can, in a sense, act unlawfully. They can, in a way, act outside of the law in certain ways, and sometimes they can get away with that. But I don't think it's impossible for the um, ultimate criteria of validity to be altered. I was going to say something about um, revolutionary constitutions, but maybe I could... We have time. Yeah. People want to hear about revolutionary constitutions? Okay, um, by acclaim. Um, all right, so there's, there's, a, there's a standard issue about um, revolutionary constitutions. It's a, it's a usage from Kelson. You know, Kelson asks, well, what happens when you simply have a constitution that's brought in as a revolutionary act? It doesn't have to be a violent revolutionary act. It's just an act. It's revolutionary in the sense that it's not authorized by pre-existing law. Okay, so a very good example is the 1937 Constitution of Ireland. Okay, the 1937 Constitution is particularly interesting because it seems that the um, the Doyle could have enacted it under the statute of Westminster and had the power to bring in the new constitution. There was nothing to prevent them from doing that. But instead, they used a process of a plebiscite and then proclaimed the new um, constitution. In one way, they wanted to do this in order not to have it grounded in imperial legislation. Okay, so the whole point of it was to say this was a new basis for the legal system. And the question is, on a sort of broadly Hartian perspective, um, if we think about the ultimate criteria of validity as playing a role here, um, this sometimes is thought to lead to a certain puzzle. The puzzle I mentioned at the beginning about the ultimacy of the Constitution. Because it seems if the Constitution is law, it can only be law because it's validated by the rule of recognition. Okay, the courts or the officials now except that the 1937 Constitution is the law of Ireland. And that's what makes it the law of Ireland. Whereas lawyers often think that it's the Constitution that is ultimate. The Constitution is the ultimate law. There's nothing beyond it. It's the final stepping point. And so, are they confused? Are they wrong? Um, well, I don't think so. I think there's a... Um, I think what this points to is an interesting feature of um, validity and validation. 
um, which is this. It's important to distinguish between a law creating act and the law created by an act. So whether it's a precedent or a statute, the law creating act is the handing down of a judgment or the passing of a statute. But the law that's created by those two actions is not the same as, for example, the text of the, stat of the precedent or even the text of the statute. Okay, the law is derived from those two things, but is somewhat different to them. Okay, we can't just read off, for example, even from a statute, what the law is. One has to construe it, one has to interpret it. And so it's important to bear in mind the difference between the standards created by an enactment and the enactment itself. Now, what I want to suggest is that what happens in a revolutionary case, like the case of Ireland, is that the new constitution becomes an ultimate criteria of validity. So the ultimate criteria of validity in Ireland after 1937 becomes the standards created by the 1937 constitution. So the 1937 constitution is part of the rule of recognition. It is the ultimate criteria of validity. It's not validated by the rule of recognition, but rather forms part of the rule of recognition. So this is my suggestion for how to get around this problem, this problem um, that um, arises from the idea that the Constitution can, seems to be ultimate, but also seems to depend in some way on the rule of recognition. My suggestion is it does depend on the rule of recognition, but it depends on the rule of recognition because the Constitution itself is mentioned in the rule of recognition as the basis for the standards that it creates. Constitutional law is validated law, but the Constitution itself is not. Okay, so that's just some of the possible implications of some of this discussion of customary law in Faro. Um, and it's my hope that the, the light this sheds on some of these puzzles is um, another reason for recognizing its existence. Thank you. Thank you.